I never played the game by yours truly, Howard Cosell. In the words of Shaevsky, quote, I am closer to the end than the beginning, end quote. And thus it seems to me that this is the time for this book. I have worked very hard in the past 32 years, fighting for what I believed in, risking my career because many of my actions seemed on the surface adverse to the interests of my company. But I have been fortunate enough to have, on the whole, succeeded. I never played the game with advertisers, with my own company, or with the sports operators. And, of course, I never played the game as a professional athlete. Have I made compromises? Yes, because I am human. But I know in my heart and mind that I never forfeited a major principle during my whole career. So in this book, I hope to take you inside the world of sports so you can perceive why very often the least significant things that happen in sports are those things that occur within the arena rather than without it. I never played the game. On Labor Day weekend, 1970, funeral services for Vincent T. Lombardi were held, appropriately enough, in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. It was a high mass, dignified and majestic, conducted by the late Terence Cardinal Cook, and no one who was there will ever forget the somber farewell to the legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers and the Washington Redskins. I sat with my wife, thinking of all the years I had known Lombardi, all the way back to Brooklyn, where we had each grown up. And then he went on to Fordham, and I ended up at his school's arch-rival, New York University. I thought, too, about his devotion to his God, his family, his craft, and the men who played for him, and how his simple and singular virtues were often twisted and misrepresented by the media. In the hush of the great cathedral, you could hear people weeping, people from all walks of life, statesmen and soldiers, priests and politicians, athletes and owners. And it seemed that the bigger they were, the harder they cried, especially the men who knew him best, the men with names such as Robustelli and Gifford and Rote, Horning and Kramer, and Starr and Jurgensen. Sitting directly in front of me was Larry Brown, then one of the finest running backs in professional football. He had been a failed player until Lombardi came to Washington, but the great coach had discovered that Brown was hard of hearing and had had a hearing aid implanted in his helmet. Almost overnight, Brown achieved stardom. That day, he could not contain his emotions, and he wept like a child who had just lost his father. When the funeral service finally ended, we all solemnly spilled out onto Fifth Avenue, our eyes red from tears, and then many of us proceeded to the cemetery. It was a memorable tribute to Lombardi, and now, when I think back on it, a memorable day in the life of the National Football League. Nine years later, there was another service, this one for Carol Rosenblum, the owner of the Los Angeles Rams. In attendance were singers and actors. There were comedians and stale jokes. And there was the widow who arrived late for her own husband's funeral. Think about it. A funeral as halftime entertainment across a single decade those two services seem to me to mark a transformation from dignity and majesty to vulgarity and burlesque and to serve as a metaphor for the decline of the National Football League. I sat in the garden of his estate on Bellagio Drive in Bel Air, waiting for the funeral services to begin. 600 people were there, including a roll call of Hollywood greats, some of whom may actually have met the deceased in life. Rosenblum had relished the part of social lion. His tennis court, a mecca for nearly everybody who was anybody, 
Now, as I looked around, there were Cary Grant, Jimmy Stewart, Greer Gawson, Warren Beatty, Diane Keaton, Ricardo Montalbain, and scores of others. The funeral service was not exactly, well, funereal. In questionable taste, it was conducted as a celebration, presided over by comedian Jonathan Winters, who used the occasion to draw upon many of his rejected routines of the past. We had arrived at 2.30 p.m., a half hour early. Somewhere, a band was playing, festively. Everything's coming up roses. Three o'clock came and went, but Georgia, the deceased owner's oft-married second wife, had not appeared. Now, nearly an hour late, the program could begin. Georgia, who fancies herself a vocalist, had wanted to sing, but had been talked out of it. Georgia would not let her husband slip quietly into the dark. There was music, and there was comedy, some of it intentional. Finally, I spoke. I looked at Georgia and told her I understood how she felt. She wanted his friends to celebrate Carol's life, not mourn his death. But I had known Carol Rosenblum too long and too well. I closed by quoting Lord Byron's apostrophe to the ocean. Roll on, thou deep and dark blue ocean, roll. And so the ocean took him. Wellington Mara of the Giants, who cannot be characterized as a friend of mine, and Ethel Kennedy, whose courage I admire, both thanked me for lending some dignity to the proceedings. Georgia soon fired her stepson, Steve, who went to New Orleans and lasted less than a year as general manager. She negotiated a large New York bank loan to buy out the club shares held by Steve and the other Rosenblum children. One by one, she purged the franchise of people hired by or loyal to her husband. If turbulence had been Rosenblum's mission in life, Georgia carried on his work. Ironically, in Georgia's first season as leader of the team, the Rams managed to make the Super Bowl, an achievement that had long eluded her husband for all his scheming and mischief. Several months later, on July 21st, 1980, Georgia Rosenblum married her lyricist, Dominic Frontieri. According to news reports, the marriage was her eighth, and around Los Angeles, bumper stickers bore the message, Hunk, if you've been married to Georgia. So in the passage of one decade, I had been witness to two services, Lombardi's and Rosenblum's, two vastly different memorials with vastly different values, moral, ethical, and spiritual. Lombardi's values dominated the NFL at the start of the decade, Rosenblum's at the end, and the decline of the NFL could be seen in power, greed, arrogance, complacency, and disregard for the public. Money, from whatever source, had taken over the league. The old heroes were becoming memories. The games would become a stereotype. The athletes curiously faceless. And the public would grow to miss the spirit, the fervor of the competition it had loved and thrilled to. My reasons for leaving Monday Night Football were numerous and complex. When I walked away from professional boxing, my decision was based on a clear and simple set of principles. I could no longer be connected with it on moral grounds, and I had despaired of ever seeing legislation achieved that would provide some reasonable and improved administration of the sport. In contrast, my departure from Monday Night Football was accompanied by a kaleidoscope of emotions. In broadest terms, I'll not deny that for a number of years I enjoyed covering pro football. Doing those telecasts gave me a tremendous ego gratification in a career sense. My association with Muhammad Ali had made me a national celebrity, but Monday Night Football with its weekly primetime exposure, vastly multiplied that celebrity status. After a while, though, you come to realize just how synthetic fame can be and how fleeting its pleasures. 
People tend to regard you as public property, and everybody wants a piece of you. I began to hunger for privacy, which was impossible to obtain when we took the show on the road, and I was once again thrust into the glare of the spotlight. Intellectually, looking back on it, my work on Monday Night Football is a matter of monumental indifference to me. I'm a man of causes, and I never had a cause. My real fulfillment in broadcasting has always come for crusading journalism, fighting for the rights of people such as Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali, and Kurt Flood. And obviously, there was none of that on Monday Night Football. In 1983, my last season with the show, I was 65 years old. And at that age, you begin to wonder about how many more years you've got on this earth. My father was a traveling auditor, and he died on the road, far from his home and his family. And I resolved not to endure the same kind of passing. Whatever time was left me, I wanted to spend it with my wife and my children and their children. Three other reasons also played a part in my leaving Monday Night Football. My own sense of morality, the overwhelming boredom, and my relationship with my two longtime colleagues, Giffen and Merritt. First, the moral problem I had with the NFL. I no longer believed in the league, and I became increasingly disillusioned with what I felt was a deception of the American public. Thanks to Monday Night Football, the NFL took off in the 70s, becoming the most powerful, prestigious, and glamorous organization in professional sports. At the same time, however, what was happening off the field began to sicken me. As I have related in previous chapters, power eventually corrupted a lot of the owners and the men who run the league. Greed and political chicanery became normal business practices. Their arrogance knew no bounds. They thought they had a license to do exactly as they pleased, particularly with regard to carpet-bagging franchises or threatening to carpet-bag franchises if the cities in which they played didn't come through with bigger stadiums, better tax breaks, and other concessions. The NFL got away with such outrageous behavior for two reasons. One, its partnership with three networks. And two, its almost all-encompassing influence over the sports writers who could be counted on to parrot the party line. It was disgraceful, and I wanted no part of it. This doesn't mean that I came to dislike and disrespect every owner. Some, in fact, I still count as friends. But it does mean that as a group, under the leadership of Commissioner Pete Rosell, their conduct was, in my view, in defiance of the public interest. And that's the way it remains today. Nothing has changed. I've mentioned that the game had become an utter bore. One week collided into another, and I got the distinct impression that I was watching a rerun of a game I had seen before. It was like a form of Chinese water torture. I became convinced that every team in the league was using the same playbook. Hell, you could have photocopied the first game of the season and played it for 16 straight weeks, and nobody would have known the difference. Where were the so-called brilliant football minds? Why was there such a dearth of creative action to heighten one's enthusiasm? I'd grown disgusted with television's continuing reliance on former athletes. It had reached outlandish proportions. Every time I turned around, another ex-jock had found his way into broadcasting. The result? Their presentation of a game had begun to sound like a broken record. And for my own money, not only had I tired of working the games, but also I couldn't even view them in my living room without either falling asleep or grinding my teeth at the inadequacy of the ex-jocks and the ineptitude of the telecasts. Ex-jocks such as Pat Summerall, Joe Garagiola, and Bob Uecker have indeed applied themselves and worked hard over a long period of years. They have ability, talent, and newcomer Ahmad Rashad has potential. But generally speaking, these alleged analysts and color men serve a limited role, and they rarely prove themselves capable of bridging the gap between entertainment and journalism. The bottom line, 
They are not communicators. Put an ex-jock in the boot, and their cliche-ridden presentation of a game is the least of their sins. As a result of their lack of training, most of them are blessedly lost when trying to establish a storyline for a telecast. For example, detecting trends, keying on the personality and experiences of a player as they relate to his performance on the field, knowing his strengths and weaknesses, recalling the flow of events from earlier in the game and from other games in other years. Thus, they tend to view a game as a series of plays rather than as a contest, and often they are ignorant of the human perspective. What the ex-jocks had perpetrated on my medium was bad enough, but then I had to read know-nothing sports television critics praising them for their supposed insights. What a joke. Listen to the ex-jocks they wrote, and you'll get the inside of the game. Inside? Come on. All of which leads me to my colleagues. Right here and now, let me say that Gifford is a friend of mine and always will be. Meredith is an engaging fellow. I am very fond of O.J. Simpson and he of me. Working with them, however, had finally taken its toll. As my tolerance for the pervasiveness of the jockocracy sunk lower and lower, it became almost impossible for me to find any satisfaction or contentment in my role on Monday Night Football. Through all those years, I had to restrain myself for their benefit, and I got sick and tired of it. The fact is, there were many times when I had to subjugate myself on the telecast, doing it their way instead of my way to help them for the good of the show. Nobody understood that better than the genuine professionals in this business. As NBC's Dick Enberg told Tony Kornheiser of the Washington Post, quote, People don't appreciate how well Howard has featured those with whom he has worked. When he likes you, he can make you look great on the air, and that's an art. He made Meredith. Last year, time and again, he set up O.J. perfectly. I'll really miss his balance on those games. Taking nothing away from the other guys, when Howard said something, you listen. Isn't that why we're here? End of quote. If my colleagues on Monday Night Football had really appreciated what I had done, they rarely showed it. I give you an impromptu meeting at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel in Beverly Hills. It was the middle of November 1979, and I had stuck around out there to speak at a dinner honoring David Wolper, the brilliant producer who has masterminded such blockbuster hits as Roots and the Thornbirds. In attendance at that meeting were Giffen, Meredith, and me, along with president of ABC Sports, Rue Knowledge, and the director of Monday Night Football, Chet Forty. We were there because of Meredith, who had been making unhappy noises about his position on the show. Until we had all gathered together, I really had no idea what the hell was going on. Urged by Forty to speak up and clear the air, Meredith complained about me, and Gifford backed him up. In a nutshell, this was what each had to say. I have things to say, said Meredith, points to make, and Howard keeps getting in my way. Gifford, Howard seems to be angry in the booth, and he's making us uncomfortable. They had teamed up against me, and I was outraged. I had given my life's blood to the package. I was still the object of vicious attacks in the press, and here they were with their petty complaints that I simply did not deserve complaints that had no basis in fact. Every study ever taken of the Monday night football telecast had revealed that nobody talked more than Gifford and that Meredith made his most valid contributions when he played off me. I needed that, right? I had busted my ass for them, and for what? So they could turn on me. My blood boiled. I kept pressing Meredith. Can you please be more specific, Don? What is it that you want to do that you're not doing now? Meredith had no specifics to offer, merely babbling on about having things to say. Like what? He never articulated. As usual, Forty walked a tightrope. Having worked the telecast from the beginning, he knew what I meant to the package, and he thought my colleagues' complaints were ludicrous. At the same time, however, he worked for Allage, and he had been around long enough to sense that Arledge wanted to appease both Gifford, 
whom he was close to, personally and socially, and Meredith, who was Gifford's best friend. Forty was too self-serving to rock the boat and express his true feelings about what was being said against me. He played both sides of the street while privately giving me my due and trying to keep me cool. As for Olage, he essentially said nothing, which was always his tactic at such confrontational meetings. Later that night, however, I invited Olage and his then wife, Anne, to accompany me home on a private plane provided by Walter. Since others were along for the ride, we didn't get an opportunity to talk much, but I did tell Olage that I thought the meeting was a shabby exhibition of opportunism and ingratitude. I think you misunderstood their intentions, all it said. I didn't misunderstand anything, Rune. They meant well, all it said. Come on. They want me out of the booth and you know it. Don quit the package for three years because he wanted to be the star of the show and he couldn't. He still wants it. And so does Gifford. And they think the only way they can get it is with me out of the way. Fine. They can have it. My contract was up in a matter of weeks. Still seething after that meeting in Los Angeles, I began to have serious doubts about staying with Monday Night Football. I contacted my attorney, Bob Shulman, and told him about my misgivings. Shulman then called Fred Pierce, who was then the company's executive vice president and top aide to ABC president Elton Rule. You mean too much to too many people, Pierce said. I'd hate to see you leave Monday Night Football. Let's face it, Howard, you are Monday Night Football. Pierce then summoned Olage to join us, and he was told of my dissatisfaction and what I thought was best for my future. What you're telling me you want to do isn't enough for you, Howard, Olage said. Monday Night Football is a part of you, and you need that forum. On a personal and professional level, you won't be satisfied without it. Besides, Howard, think of the company. Monday Night Football is of utmost importance to ABC, and the company needs you there. Radio is nice. So are horse racing and boxing and baseball. But they don't compare to Monday Night Football. Over the next few days, I searched my heart. There was a lot of truth to what Olage had said, though I was still upset with him for not backing me in Los Angeles. And what the hell? I'll admit it. No other show was going to pay me more than Monday Night Football, and I wanted the money for me, my wife, my children, and my grandchildren. Like any doting grandfather, I wanted the best for the newest members of my family, and I was determined that they should never want for a thing, that they'd be well taken care of long after I was gone. Shulman got word to Olage that I would stay with Monday Night Football. Shulman was prepared to work out a new deal for me as quickly as possible, and Olage agreed to get to it. Instead, he dragged his feet. Phone calls from my attorney weren't returned, and it annoyed the hell out of me. Finally, a few days before Christmas, I got a call from Herb Granith, a good friend, and then the assistant to rule. Granith wanted to know at what time I planned to show up at the Christmas party being thrown by ABC's entertainment division. I was supposed to play Santa Claus. No kidding. White beard, red suit, the whole schmear. This isn't going to be easy, Herbie, I said. I'm not exactly imbued with the holiday spirit. What's wrong, Granith asked. All it still hasn't approved my deal. I've been jerked around for too long, and I'm furious about it. Nothing's been done. You serious? I assured Granith that I was. You come to the party, Howard, Granith said. The contract will be there. Sign. Pierce arrived at the party with my contract, and it was signed by him personally, not Arledge. I got everything I had asked for, and when we shook hands, Pierce said, his to a whole new beginning. I will forever have ambivalent feelings about Frank Gifford. Somewhere inside me, if you go deep enough, I consider him a friend. And if you go deep enough inside Gifford, he considers me a friend. There were times when he touched me with his warmth and caring. I was always impressed with his commitment to the Special Olympics for mentally handicapped kids. And when his first wife, Maxine, 
whom Emmy and I love dearly, contacted multiple sclerosis. Frank started an MS chapter in New York. It was because of Gifford, along with former Notre Dame football coach Era Parsegian, that I served as national chairman of MS for four years. And together we set new records for fundraising. When I left Monday Night Football, I received a letter from Frank's estranged second wife, Astrid, wishing me well and saying how much Frank respected me and depended on me on the show. That said, I'm well aware that Frank Gifford represents motherhood and apple pie and that a great many men would like their sons to grow up to be just like him, a handsome football hero and a glamorous media personality. Frank has led a charmed life. But in all fairness, he has worked diligently to achieve everything he has. And he has inspired in many people a sense of being a loyal and dependable friend in times of trouble. What I have to say about Frank is based largely on my view as a professional broadcaster and journalist. You will get opinions and you will get facts. In no way should this be misconstrued as a personal attack against Frank. It's as measured and forthright an assessment as I can make about somebody with whom I've worked for almost half my ABC career. To begin, Gifford's greatest talent is not in broadcasting. He is what he is, a physically attractive man with a matchless ability to charm almost everybody he meets. One adjective often used to describe Gifford is nice. That he is, maybe too nice. He's also easy, easy to like, easy to humor, easy to interview, maybe too easy. He is a master at masking his emotions, as evidenced by his bravery in dealing with Maxine's multiple sclerosis. After so many years of playing the role of hero, first at USC, then with the Giants and Monday Night Football, he has grown so accustomed to the part that he often seems more concerned about preserving his image than expressing his true feelings. Believe me, I know full well the personal storms that Gifford has weathered, and there is pain and bitterness within him that he suppresses for the sake of remaining everybody's all-American. As a result, there is nothing controversial about Frank. Like President Reagan, he is a Teflon man. No matter how glaring his weaknesses as a performer, nothing sticks to him. The sports television critics, wooed by a smooth off-camera personality, generally rave about him, rarely taking him to task on purely objective standards. And since Gifford is one of Olage's closest friends in life, Gifford will always have security at ABC. I do not understand Don Meredith, and I never will. In the beginning, I loved the guy. He was terribly insecure about his performance in the booth, and I'd often counsel him to stick with it and assure him that he would prevail. Eventually, he ended up winning an Emmy. I was genuinely pleased for him, in spite of the fact that I realized he had won a popularity contest. What the hell? At least his philosophical approach to football and his job appealed to me. I mean, I had to react favorably to a guy who'd sit high above the game and say, there's got to be more to life than what's going on down there. I respected Meredith for that, and I believe he truly meant it. On the other hand, Meredith rarely prepared for a telecast in the manner of a professional broadcaster. Putting the games in their proper perspective is one thing, but he often showed no interest at all. He'd try to compensate for his lack of knowledgeability by singing a song or talking to his imaginary alter ego, Holly Schmidlap, and everybody would write about how funny and irrepressible he was. Meredith's lackadaisical attitude never bothered me as much as it did Gifford, who always worried about his friend's state of mind and how cooperative he'd be during a telecast. As far as I was concerned, Meredith could play the part of my foil ad infinitum, and I'd set him up with one-liners, even if they occasionally zing me, as long as he wasn't hurting the telecast. And besides... Olage loved Meredith's act and felt he added immeasurably to the proper admixture of football savvy, humor, and entertainment. That was the essence of the package. I sometimes wondered if Olage really knew what was going on in the booth and how difficult it could be trying to keep Meredith on an even keel 
and aware of what was happening in a game. It got to the point where Forty used to tell the press that Meredith was at his best when he didn't even know who was playing. Easy for him to say. Of course, the press lapped it up. One of Meredith's greatest attributes was supposed to be his unpredictability. Well, few people ever knew it, but Meredith's unpredictability wasn't necessarily a matter of his performing style. I think Don wrestles with life. I'm not sure if he's ever known what he really wants to be or what he's really capable of accomplishing. He's uncertain about himself, and it produces a behavior pattern that I call Texas cruel. There's a mean streak within him, and it was hard to figure out just when it would manifest itself. He groused and grumbled, snapped at people, and he could be contrary in the extreme. On those occasions, he was hardly the lovable old cowboy with the homespun view of the world that was so ingratiating. Not in the least. Meredith was most ornery during the last half of the 1973 season when he had determined in his own mind that he wanted out of the package. It was at that time that I traveled to Bermuda to run a sales effort for ABC, and most of the company brass was there. No sooner had I arrived than I received a phone call from an old friend in Los Angeles, a public relations whiz named Jim Mahoney. His first words to me were, you've got to get off that fucking show. After talking to Mahoney from Los Angeles, I happened to be with Elton Rule, then the president of ABC. I'd like to talk to you about the telecast the other night, he said. Please, Elton, I'd rather not, I said. What the hell is going on with that imbecile, Rule said, referring to Meredith and his treatment of me. Look, Elton, it's up to you and to Allage to control Meredith. I'm doing the best that I can under the circumstances, but I don't know how much more I can take. Sometimes he's just impossible to deal with. What can I say? You heard him. Meredith is Allage's guy. Talk to Rune about him, not me. As far as I know, nothing was ever said to Meredith. At the end of the season, when Meredith's intentions to leave the package became obvious, all had spent days trying to talk him out of it. When all hope was gone of keeping Meredith, all had told me, he's leaving Howard, and that's that. Whatever I said was to no avail. In fact, Don was adversarial with me. Without saying it in so many words, Allage also indicated that I was one of the reasons for Meredith's unhappiness. The implication seemed to be that if Allage had gotten rid of me, then Meredith might have considered staying on. Meredith wanted to be the unqualified star of the telecast. If he couldn't, bye-bye. After Meredith left the package, I talked with Joe Namath about joining Frank and me in the booth. Still playing quarterback for the Jets, he had style and panache, and he was articulate and no stranger to performing. We even discussed it over drinks with Allage on the terrace of my apartment. I know that Allage had broached the subject with Namath's attorney, but nothing came of it. Then I brought Dick Butkus to meet Allage, a former all-pro middle linebacker with the Chicago Bears. Butkus possessed an infectious personality, and I sensed that he was a hell of a performer. Allage didn't agree. I guess he didn't think Butkus was good-looking enough. At any rate, Allage picked a former defensive back with the Kansas City Chiefs named Fred, the Hammer, Williamson, to replace Meredith. History will record that Williamson was so palpably unsuited for broadcasting that he was unceremoniously fired after a few exhibition games. And guess who took the heat for Williamson's demise? You've got it. Williamson had the gall to allege that I was anti-black. He gave interviews claiming that he was a better performer than I and that I was jealous of him. Thus, I got him fired. Of course, the press ran with Williamson's charges, painting him as the poor victim of a monstrous ego. It was a total lie. To replace Williamson, Allage hired Alex Karras, the former mighty defensive tackle of the Detroit Lions. At the time, Karras was a good choice. He had a quick wit, and his increasing self-assurance as a performer was reflected in the fact that he was getting more roles in Hollywood. In addition, I liked Karras as a human being. He was a sensitive man. He was also a straight shooter, up front, and it was pleasant working with him because I didn't have to worry about two guys ganging up on me all the time. Karras was his own man, went his own way, 
and he didn't care whether his opinions jived either with mine or Gifford's. After a couple of years, though, Karras had lost interest in the package. Things were going very well for him in his acting career, and it was time for him to move on. Karras hung around another year, and then Arledge went out and rebagged Meredith. Meredith had spent his three years away from Monday Night Football under contract to NBC, primarily hoping to make his mark as an actor. He thought he had the kind of talent that he didn't remotely possess, and he found the going tough. He was associated with one of the most expensive bombs in network history, an ill-fated primetime series called Super Train, which was the brainchild of then-NBC president Fred Silverman. But let me stress that Meredith is blessed with an appealing personality, and I thought he turned in several credible performances on the police story anthology. As far as sports was concerned, Meredith never really clicked with Kurt Gowdy on NBC telecasts of NFL football. In my opinion, Gowdy was the best all-around play-by-play announcer who has yet lived, but he always played it straight, and Meredith was lost without having anybody to react to. Meredith had to play the part of a color man in the classic sense of the term, and his old problems with being unprepared were more obvious than ever. When Meredith returned to Monday Night Football, I figured that he'd be somewhat chastened by his experience at NBC. However, I never noticed any perceptible change in Don. His buttress was Gifford, and before too long, the two of them were once again having a high old time together. What's more, Frank helped Meredith secure very profitable commercial work through Ross Johnson of Nabisco, and Meredith was properly appreciative. In the booth, he became increasingly subservient to Frank, often complimenting Gifford for even the most ordinary observations. Check the tapes. How often did you hear Meredith utter words to this effect? Oh, that Frank. He's a smart one. One well, nice going, fella. Frank really knows his stuff, don't he? And yet in the booth, Meredith would nudge me and smirk every time Frank made a mistake. There were times, too, when privately... Along with me, he'd shake his head and say, you know, the truth is Frank isn't calling a good game. It really didn't matter, though. When push came to shove, Gifford and Meredith were as thick as thieves. They would never take sides against each other, and somehow I always was cast as the bad guy. I could never really trust either one of them. When I officially quit Monday Night Football, I never heard a word from Meredith. Not a call, not a note. It wasn't until late December, 1984, that he made contact with me. He and his wife sent Emmy and me a Christmas card. There was a personal note. It's not the same without you. We miss you terribly. As part of his new deal, Meredith had begged out of working a full schedule of games, which meant that Arledge needed to hire a fourth announcer to fill in during Meredith's absences. He chose Fran Tarkenton the former scrambling quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings. Fran and I liked each other. He often sought my advice, and I was glad to help. Before his first telecast, the Hall of Fame exhibition game, Tarkenton said, Howard, I'll be lost. Please lead me. I'll follow every lead you give me, which he did. I'd steer him away from spouting a lot of incomprehensible jock jargon by setting him up with questions that touched on his experience as a quarterback enabled him to explain what was happening on the field in flesh and blood terms. For example, Fran, what makes you think this kid can make it as a quarterback in the NFL? What are his assets? Or when a receiver dropped an easy pass, I'd ask him, what do you think the quarterback will say to him in the huddle? These are hardly penetrating questions. The point was to get Fran thinking about the viewers and giving them information they could readily grasp. As a result, he didn't get bogged down talking about X's and O's, and he came to appreciate what I was trying to do for him. Fran and I got along so well, in fact, that he'd sometimes call me for advice on matters beyond the booth. He once called me and asked me if he should accept a job as one of the regular hosts of a primetime series called That's Incredible. Apparently, ABC Sports was pressuring him not to take it. You tell them to go to hell, I said. That's 20,000 bucks a week. You take that job. It's a hell of a lot better than working a handful of games each year. As silly a show as it was, 
That's incredible. Ended up a big ratings winner for four years, and Fran made a small fortune. He never forgot what I had told him. When the axe fell on Tarkington, Arledge never consulted me concerning a replacement. He had already made up his mind to put O.J. Simpson on the package. At first, I had no quarrel with his choice. For one thing, it wasn't of monumental significance to me because I knew I didn't want to work the games much longer. And besides, thanks to all the commercials Juice was getting, I thought his speech was improving and he could handle the assignment. I was wrong. Once again, except in rare instances, it was a mistake to take a jock and put him on the air, and I ended up feeling sorry for the man. My emotions concerning Simpson run deep. I got to know the juice when he was a star at USC, and when he came to New York to accept the Heisman Trophy, he asked me to take him to Joe Namath's joint, Bachelors Three. The New York Times sports columnist then, Robert Lipside, accompanied us. And we sat at a table in the back. The Juice was anxious to meet the famous New York quarterback. When Namath finally arrived, he hung out at the bar. I knew he had spotted us, but he refused to acknowledge our presence. After a half hour or so, I started to get up, saying, This is ridiculous. I'm going to get that son of a bitch and bring him back here. The Juice touched my arm. Howard, he said, You can't rush the great ones. Let him play his little game. The Juice finally got to meet Namath, but what I took away from that day was a lasting impression of Simpson. I remember thinking, this kid's got a lot on the ball. He's nobody's fool. Midway through his pro career, Simpson got his first big break on television. All had used him as the Sunday host on Wide World of Sports. By then, the Juice and I had developed a close personal relationship Sunday was my day off, but I'd catch a cab to the studio to be with Simpson. I'd play cards with him, shoot the breeze, give him a few pointers, try to relax him. Then, after the show, he'd usually wind up at my apartment for a few drinks with Emmy and me before heading for the airport. He was like a part of the family. Howard, he used to say to me, before my race is run, I've got to do Monday night football with you. It's the dream of my life. Anyway, the Juice's first appearance on Monday Night Football came during an exhibition game in Washington. Not bad, I thought. He had made some excellent points, but there was still a lot of fine-tuning ahead of him. After the game, we had drinks together at the Watergate Hotel. I told him the following. What you must do is slow your speech. Your mind operates like a jackrabbit going down the road. It's ahead of itself and you don't yet have the dictional capacity for your tongue to keep up with it in an understandable way. Don't worry about showing the public how much you know. Much of what you know, they won't understand anyway. They won't care. Keep it simple. Measure your words. Tonight, when you notice that it wasn't the running back who was responsible for the fumble, but the quarterback who caused the loss of the ball, that stuff works. That's the kind of thing the public can understand. Then, when we replayed it and the viewers saw it, they probably said to themselves, gee, the juice was right. That's the kind of thing you can do and do effectively. Just remember, though, slow down. Get comfortable. I know it seems as though you've got a lot to say and so little time to say it, but you'll learn to economize. First, work on your speech. Like any rookie, Juice had his ups and downs in 1983, but I began to doubt whether he'd ever conquer his elocution problems. The fact that he didn't have to appear on the package every week was a blessing in disguise. While the sports television critics were generally kind to him, as they usually are with ex-jocks, the viewing public didn't get a chance to experience how familiarity can breed contempt. Simpson's enthusiasm often masked a lot of his weaknesses, and unlike Gifford, at least he was willing to criticize players and coaches. I worried, however, that the juice was fighting a losing battle. Nevertheless, as it turned out, my biggest disappointment was not with juice as a broadcaster, but as a friend. As you shall see, if it weren't for all the years we had known each other, I don't think our friendship could have survived. 
With the summer of 1983 came the news that Simpson would be joining us in the booth. It was then that I started dropping broad hints about cutting back on my Monday night football schedule, or perhaps even leaving the show altogether. If I didn't quit soon, I theorized, they'd have to cart me into the booth in a wheelchair. It was time for me to take cognizance of my age and my health, and there was really nothing left for me to accomplish in broadcasting. These feelings were first expressed in a Sports Illustrated cover story about me by Frank DeFord, then in an article by the enormously talented Tom Shells, the television critic of the Washington Post. End of side one. Little did I know then that the very first regular season game of the 1983 Monday Night Football schedule would crystallize my worst misgivings about remaining with the show and intensify my desire to quit. In that game, between the Washington Redskins and the Dallas Cowboys, I happened to call Redskins wide receiver Alvin Garrett most affectionately a tough little monkey. Garrett is black, and at the time, I was praising his talent and relating how his coach, Joe Gibbs, appreciated having him around. No matter. That single, innocent remark caused a national sensation fueled by the sports writers and fanned by the Reverend Joseph Lowry of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The furor over that crack lasted for what seemed like days on end. I was besieged by phone calls for interviews, letters of support from the leaders of the black community all over the nation, and a steady stream of commentary in the press. It was ludicrous. Considering my lifelong record with regard to race relations and my association with the likes of Jackie Robinson, Muhammad Ali, and Kurt Flood, imagine how I felt being castigated in some quarters as a racist, and how absurd it was that I even needed defending. Just prior to working the World Series, I went to Buffalo for a game between the Bills and the New York Jets. This marked the juices turn in the spotlight as he was returning to the city where he had spent his glory days as a pro. At a luncheon on the day of the game, he made several unfortunate remarks that got picked up in the press and, quite frankly, infuriated me. What he did, in essence, was question my knowledge of football and promise to bring his own special brand of insights to the telecast. I let it pass. Simpson, however, wouldn't let up. While I was off doing the World Series, I continued to read how Simpson intended to teach me a thing or two about the game. Then, one night, I got a call at my apartment from Simpson. He had heard the rumors, and he wondered if they were true. You can't leave Monday Night Football, Howard, he said. Without you, there is no Monday Night Football. Well... That's not what I've been reading in the newspapers. What are you talking about? I don't know the game. You're the one who's going to bring fresh insights to the telecast. Crap like that, all attributed to you. Come on, Howard, you know those fucking writers. No juice. The first time, maybe. But it's been happening too often for me to dismiss those stories as mere fantasy. There was now desperation in O.J.'s voice. I was misquoted, Howard, he insisted. I don't have to tell you about the writers. They twisted everything I said. You're no virgin, O.J. You've been dealing with the press since you were a kid. But, Howard, I don't want to talk to you, Juice. I was your friend. I always tried to help you going back so many years. I can't believe the things you've been saying about me. I understand why you did it, but that's no excuse. It's over between us. Simpson broke down and cried. I handed the phone to Emmy. You talk to him, dear, I said. He's very upset. When Emmy got on, Simpson said, You know how much I love Howard and how much I love you. I never meant to hurt Howard. He's my dear friend. Emmy kept saying, 
Calm down, O.J., calm down. Everything will work itself out. Emery really didn't know what else to say, and I got on again. I felt terrible. We'll talk again when I see you, Juice, I said. I eventually relented, and O.J. and I patched up our differences. He is basically a decent man. I will always like him. We had come too far, I guess, not to remain friends. The last game of the Monday night football season was scheduled for San Francisco. I didn't go. That was it. For the record, the last Monday night football game I worked was in Miami, the Dolphins against the Jets. It was a terrible game. Miami won easily. The Jets coach Joe Walton had taken the best group of players in the NFL and reduced them to nothing. Another brilliant coaching mind. For the first time in my life, the majority of columns written about my leaving Monday Night Football were flattering. I received either letters or phone calls from almost every NFL owner, dozens of players, colleagues from within and without my company, and people from almost every walk of life, including the likes of Jesse Jackson, U.S. Senator Bill Bradley, and Kirk Douglas. It was extraordinary. I'm sure that my absence had a negative effect on the ratings. Without me, the nature of the telecast was entirely altered. I had commanded attention. I had palpable impact on the show, giving it a sense of moment. And now it seemed no different from an ordinary Sunday afternoon telecast. If that sounds like ego, what can I say? I'm telling it like it is. Several newspapers started conducting polls and surveys, and viewers voted overwhelmingly for my return. Even the sports television critics got into the act, running stories with headlines like, Howie, come back, and Howard, the guys need you. Hey, I'm only human. I'll not lie about it. Some small part of me, on a highly personal level, was gratified to witness the eroding ratings. I didn't want my company hurt, but if any performer tells you that he has terrible feelings about a show being less successful without him, don't believe it. By the way, during all this time, I never heard from Arledge. He simply kept repeating in the press that it was too early to assess the impact of my absence on the ratings and that all Monday night football really needed was a good game. What nonsense. Even the good games weren't drawing what they should have. The truth is that Arledge was loath to give me any credit. As I've said, I firmly believe that Arledge thought the ratings would soar with three jocks in the booth. He was wrong, and he wouldn't admit it. As far as Monday Night Football goes, if I were negotiating for ABC, I'd tell Roselle flat out, let's cut the crap. If you want the kind of money we're paying out, then you must give my company the right to pick the games at telecasts. The way the arrangement stands now, the NFL chooses the Monday night schedule in the preceding February, and there's nothing ABC can do about it. It's a terrible deal. Monday night football scores big. The impact is felt not only by the NFL, but throughout the entire television industry as well. ABC needs a star. Let's not forget that first and foremost, Monday Night Football is primetime entertainment. It must attract big numbers, women as well as men. Okay, how about someone like Bill Cosby? That's right, Bill Cosby. He'd really shake things up, make people take notice. A former college football player, and an avid sports enthusiast, he knows what he's talking about. What's more, he's a brilliant communicator, and his performing skills are above reproach. In short, he's a prime-time dream, witty, knowledgeable, and vastly entertaining. At the moment, Cosby's got a fantastically successful sitcom on NBC, and he's not available. Too bad for ABC but that's the way the company should be thinking. Hiring another ex-jock 
just isn't going to hack it. As you have heard earlier, my distaste for the NFL and what it had come to stand for contributed to my quitting Monday Night Football. I truly wish it hadn't turned out that way. But I have no regrets about helping to popularize the league and its game. I simply did the best job I could. The huge success of Monday Night Football has always astounded me, and it's still hard for me to explain the electrifying impact it had on the public. The fame and recognition the show brought me will forever mystify me, but it's over now, and I'd like to leave the frustrations and heartaches behind me. I think I can. In quieter moments, when I think back on Monday Night Football, I'm starting to remember the good old days. And yes, Frank, Don, O.J., there is a smile on my face. Albert Camus was once an amateur boxer himself and remained a lifelong fight fan. The emotional satisfaction he got out of boxing was at odds with his intellectual opposition to violence and capital punishment, and it provoked ambivalent feelings within him. I know exactly how he felt. Boxing is drama on its grandest scale. No other athletic event is as electrifying as a championship fight. I continued to cover boxing, perhaps longer than I should have, because of my admiration for the fighters, their earthiness, and their honesty. Generally speaking, the ones who become champions spring from poverty. They work harder and sacrifice more than other athletes. Rarely do they make excuses. They have no teammates to lean on. They are out there all alone, exposed, vulnerable, valiantly summoning up reserves of courage in situations where a lot of other athletes would simply call it quits. There are no secrets in the ring, and they willingly accept the fears and the pain and the scars as part of their trade. One need only climb into a ring to understand how terrifyingly small it is and what guts it takes to ascend those three or four little steps to engage in battle with another man. And always, they must wonder, how will it be when I come out? Early on, in the days when NBC was carrying the big fights on radio, I worked with the late undefeated heavyweight champion, Rocky Marciano, and it was through him that I learned a lot about the inside of boxing. At the time, my interest was further inspired by a great writer named W.C. Hines, and I became fascinated with fighters as people. Few athletes were more captivating subjects than Floyd Patterson, who carried his emotional baggage like a huge star on his shoulders, who used to sit alone and afraid in the subways beneath the Bedford Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn. And then there was Patterson's eccentric manager, Gus D'Amato, a reporter's dream. His Freudian lectures on boxes and boxing made you feel like you were sitting in a musty old classroom in Vienna. I called nearly all of Patterson's championship fights, and then after Patterson came Muhammad Ali and we would be locked in the public's mind as an inseparable television team. Joe Frazier and George Foreman were also favorites of mine, and soon thereafter came Sugar Ray Leonard, and I had the same kind of identification with him as I had had with Ali. And so it was, until all my years of covering fights and fighters came crashing down around me and I could no longer justify my association with the sport. November 26, 1982, the Houston Astrodome. On that date, in that place, WBC heavyweight champion Larry Holmes beat up Randall Tex Cobb in as gross a mismatch as I have ever witnessed in the ninth round alone. Holmes registered no fewer than 26 unanswered blows, and yet the referee would not stop the fight. Mercifully, 
the champion laid back in the 14th and 15th rounds so as not to inflict further damage upon Cobb, who is nothing more than a human punching bag with a tremendous capacity to absorb punishment. During that fight, I made up my mind to walk away from professional boxing forever. At the time, it was perhaps the most significant decision of my career, and I stuck to it. For almost a quarter of a century, I was ABC's boxing specialist, its most visible association with the sport, more durable than the fighters themselves. When ABC underwrote mismatches, I said so on the air, loudly and clearly. And when referees and judges rendered lousy decisions, I said so on the air, loudly and clearly. Tell it like it is is a phrase that people most likely identify with my coverage of boxing. There is no denying it, however. My public persona helped revitalize boxing's once flagging popularity and boosted its TV ratings. And of course, boxing gave me my first glimpse of media stardom. And I'd be less than honest if I didn't admit that I was gripped by a spellbinding attraction to the sport. It distressed me that the various state boxing commissions operated as independent fiefdoms and that there was no uniform code to deal with boxers' safety, records, and ratings. Such a lack of national uniformity led to many abuses. For example, a fighter denied a fight in one state could quickly obtain a license to fight in another state. And as the 1970s wore on, I was increasingly concerned about the power that was falling into the hands of promoters Don King and Robert Aram, the kind of power that the courts had ruled illegal years before. My attitudes toward the fights themselves were changing too. Unlike any other sport, the objective in boxing is chillingly simple. One man purposefully endeavors to inflict bodily harm on another man. And I had seen Benny Kid Perrette die, and Willie Classen die, and Cleveland Denny die, and the dying slowly eats away at you. I had seen Ernie Shavers and Sugar Ray Leonard hurt their eyes, and I had seen Sugar Ray Seals received permission to fight even though he was close to blindness. And I couldn't shake the wrenching anguish of watching Ali in his twilight as one comeback after another stripped him of his dignity and stature. You can't imagine how I felt when I ran into Ali shortly after his last fight. I was in Los Angeles attending a banquet Ali was there, though still a relatively young man. He was puffy, and he moved slowly, almost deliberately. Once a symphony of metaphors and rhymes, his speech was now thick, and he spoke in half-completed whisperings. Too many blows to the head and to the body had transformed him into somebody I no longer knew. He put his arm around me, and he said, I'm gone and you're still on top. Don't ever say that to me again, Muhammad, I said. You're part of American history. You'll never be gone. And so, the horrible feelings were there, chipping away at my romance with boxing. Then those same feelings started to fester and sicken me. In the weeks preceding the Holmes Cobb mismatch, a couple of events contributed to my ultimate disillusionment. First, Boom Boom Mancini defended his WBA lightweight title against a Korean named Duck Koo Kim because the WBA somehow managed to rate Kim the number one contender. There were much more worthy opponents, such as Howard Davis and Edwin Rosario, but Kim got the nod. By most reliable accounts, he did not even deserve to be ranked in the top ten. Mancini knocked him out. And later, poor Kim lapsed into a coma, 
and died. All through the week before the Holmes Cobb fiasco, I had proclaimed the fight a travesty. By the end of the fifth round, I figured that the referee, a man named Steve Crossan from Dallas, would shortly stop the fight. But no, Crossan let it continue. And I kept wondering on the air why he was permitting the debacle to go on. Sitting by my side was Don Chevrier, whom ABC was thinking of using as a substitute for me when the occasion warranted it. I was helping to break him in that night and he thoroughly agreed with me. The ninth round was an assault on the senses of any civilized human being. 26 unanswered blows. Cobb's face looked like hamburger meat, but still Crossan failed to stop the fight. Doesn't he know, I said, referring to the referee, that he is constructing an advertisement for the abolition of boxing. From then on, I did not comment at all on the fight strategy or tactics. There weren't any. The only intelligent and humane thing to do, I felt, was to keep calling for the referee to end the fight, which I did. I also repeatedly fixed the blame for this bloodbath on the referee, and to this day I still contend it was as measured a performance as I have ever given. I had no intention of insulting the audience with how tough Cobb is anecdotes. And I had no intention of becoming a two-bit shell and telling the audience to stay tuned because you never know, Cobb might win the championship with one punch. Moments after the judges awarded a unanimous decision to Holmes, what a surprise, ABC's director of the telecast, Jet Forty, informed me from the truck that New York wanted me to jump into the ring and interview the referee. Let Chevrier do it, I said disgustedly. That man should have stopped the fight. He was unqualified, and I will not dignify him with an interview. I agree with you, Howard, said Alex Wallow, the producer. You're absolutely right. I agree too, Howard, but what the hell am I supposed to do, Forty said. They're ordering me. Forty was referring to instructions that were coming out of New York from Jim Spence, vice president of ABC Sports. You'd better say something, Forty urged. They're all over me. So I did. I will not dignify this fight with any interviews, I said on the air. I think what you have seen tonight speaks for itself. It was sickening. As I was leaving the arena, people were shouting, Hey, Howie, that Texan sure can't take a punch, can he? And I thought, good Lord, don't they realize what's happened here? Four days, four weeks, four months, four years from now, that man is going to pay for the pounding he took. I had had it. The next morning at 6 o'clock, before catching a plane to Tampa for a Monday night football game. I called John Martin, vice president of ABC Sports, at his apartment in New York. What a terrible experience, Martin said. I felt sorry for you. John, I've made a decision, I said. I am never going to call another professional fight. I was with him when his name was Cassius Clay. And I was with him when he changed it to Muhammad Ali. I was with him in 1964 when he beat Sonny Liston in Miami and won the heavyweight championship of the world for the first time. And I was with him when he was in exile from boxing and when he returned to the ring, when he traveled to far-flung arenas around the globe and when he broke my heart on a humid October night in Las Vegas. That was in 1980, and Ali had convinced a lot of people that he could really whip Larry Holmes and win the heavyweight title for the fourth time. I wasn't one of them, and I told Ali so. There was no way Ali was going to beat Holmes, and he was a fool for trying. His speech was already slurred from the beatings he had taken through the years. He walked awkwardly. His hands seemed unsteady. And there was often a vacant look in his eyes. Ali listened 
to only one voice, his own, and it sang a siren song. It's hard to describe the terrible feelings I had covering that fight, watching Holmes reduce Ali to rubble. He was the greatest, and what an awful thing it was to watch him slumped and battered in a humiliating defeat. Thinking back on it now, I am certain that Ali's fight with Holmes exacerbated Ali's physical problems. In the years that followed, whenever we chanced to meet, it was practically impossible to carry on a coaching conversation with him. And that meant our once famous relationship as interviewer and subject was ended. During the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles, in fact, Ali often attended the boxing matches, which I was covering. On several occasions, a longtime friend of Ali's named Howard Bingham asked me to interview the champ. Each time I told Bingham that it wasn't right, that Ali would only embarrass himself. The following month, Ali made international headlines when he admitted himself into Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York. His illness was diagnosed as Parkinson's syndrome, which was most likely connected to the pounding he took in the ring. During that time, I got a call from the producer of ABC's Nightline, saying that he had received permission to bring cameras into Ali's hospital room. He asked me to interview him. That isn't journalism, I said. That's exploitation. I want no part of it. Let me stress that I do not pity Ali. He has already experienced enough to fill several lifetimes, tasting the kind of fame and fortune that precious few men will ever know. I am saddened, however, when I think what he might have accomplished had he remained whole. The irony is that Ali has become a victim of the sport he saved. And now the sport is in trouble for having victimized him. My family means everything to me. My wife, Emmy, my two daughters, Jill and Hillary, and my four grandchildren, Justin, Jared, Caitlin, and little Colin. They are my reasons for living, and I will grow old with them at my side. No man can ask for more. And I will have my memories, too. I've logged more than 30 years in broadcasting, a profession I love with all my heart and soul. Oh, sure, there are far too many instances of maddening incompetency, distressing hypocrisy, and sometimes frightening abuses of power. In the long run, though, I don't think I could have achieved what I did if I didn't care more than I can say for the medium. Like many men who ponder their mortality as they approach retirement, I often wonder what I might have accomplished in another profession. Might I have found more satisfaction had I stayed in law? I thoroughly enjoyed my teaching experience at Yale in the late 70s and early 80s, might I have made a great educator and inspired tomorrow's leaders. I was once urged to run for U.S. Senator from New York, and I gave it serious thought, though the personal fears of my wife and daughters over a virulent press caused me to decide against it. Might I have made an effective legislator and effected real change in this country? I will live with these questions until the day I die, but deep within me there will always be a blunt, burning passion for television, and I take comfort in the fact that I told it like it is and remained faithful to my precepts of fair and honest journalism. I would have liked to have tested my skills and tackled the larger issues in hard news. How might I have covered Vietnam, or Watergate, or a political convention? I'll never know. But at least I was able to demonstrate my ability to communicate to a mass audience and to realize an impact that very few in television have ever matched. I paid a price, of course, and that is the price of fame. 
I have endured unending scorn in print. And for what? Standing up for what I believed in. Fighting and taking on the press when I felt I was unjustly criticized. The bigger I got, the worse the attacks. I represented the rise of the television superstar over the sports writer's superstar. And the newspaper guys were jealous of me. I became rich and famous and passed them by, and they envied me. They couldn't beat me, and it only added to their frustration. I was pilloried and excoriated for doing my job and getting ahead and making a reputation beyond my wildest dreams. What did they want from me? An apology? The plain fact is, on almost every important issue in sports in my lifetime, the record stands. The overwhelming majority of sports writers was wrong, and I was right. Quick examples include Muhammad Ali and the denial of his constitutional rights, and Kurt Flood and his fight for free agency. Most sports writers also fail to grasp the sociological, political, and economic ramifications of franchise shifts, the moral bankruptcy of condoning the participation of U.S. athletes in sporting events held in apartheid South Africa, and the effrontery to human dignity and civilized behavior in supporting and glorifying professional boxing in the face of mounting medical evidence that clearly established the link between fighting and brain damage. The amazing thing is that I survived and prospered despite the press's venomous attitude toward me, and I am proud of that. And I am proud that I have never let anyone rob me of the pleasures of my work and the people and the places and the events that have combined to fill my life with such a marvelous tapestry of gladness and remembrance. How many men can say they came to know the likes of a Joe DiMaggio and a Walter Cronkite, a Frank Sinatra and a Henry Kissinger, a Woody Allen and a Lee Iacocca? I've traveled to every corner of the globe, and I've had a front row seat at some of the greatest spectacles ever staged. Telling it like it is, I've had a remarkable life. And so to all of my friends and all my foes, let me say it's been a hell of a ride. And to you, my readers, let me leave you with a few parting tales since last I shared my experiences in a book. I can't pinpoint the day or even the year exactly, but something tells me that the first time I met Rune Arledge had to be in 1962 or 1963. He was walking toward the ABC studios on West 66th Street in Manhattan as I was leaving the building, and we bumped into each other. We had never been formally introduced, but each of us knew who the other was, and we exchanged hellos. Arledge was several years away from becoming the official president of ABC Sports, but he was already making his mark as an innovative force in television. No doubt about it, Arledge was going places fast in the hierarchy of the network, and I welcomed the chance to meet with him in the future. At the time, I was still working on the local level, both in radio and television, receiving stiff resistance from the ABC brass in my attempts to get network exposure. In effect, I was being blackballed by my own company. Arledge had obviously been watching me on the local station and appreciated what I was doing. It's now part of sports television folklore how Arledge adopted me and gave me the opportunity to become, well, Howard Cosell. He defied his own superiors and fought for me. He got me on wide world of sports because he believed that nobody could qualify better than I that nobody was a more probing and provocative interviewer than I, especially when paired with a young heavyweight champion who was then named Cassius Clay. And nobody in television, even then, had the kind of access to the athletes that I had. They're only a phone call away, 
and I could produce them at a moment's notice for wide world of sports. Those who were exhilarating and rewarding years for Ollage and me. Working for Ollage, I glowed with the knowledge that I was part of a wonderful enterprise, that I too was making a mighty contribution toward establishing ABC as the standard of excellence in sports programming. And then came Monday Night Football. Ollage put me on the package and stuck with me in the face of a broadside attack on me in print. He knew we'd both prevail. His intuitive genius, that sixth sense that told him what would or wouldn't play on television, was never more apparent than when we first worked together in the 1960s. As a result of the attention and nourishment he lavished on my career, Rune and I forged a close friendship. Unfortunately, sadly, it didn't last. In the beginning, Orlidge's quest for power was a positive force. To get it, he had to think more progressively and work harder than anybody else. He gathered creative people around him, especially engineers and other technical types, then listened to their ideas, inspired them, and pushed them to perform marvels that brought a new visual intimacy to sports on television. He also demanded that his announcers humanize the athletes and broadcast a contest as if they were telling a story. He always had a knack for knowing how to capture the imagination of an audience, getting people involved in what they were watching. If I had to guess, I'd say it was the huge success of Monday Night Football that started to alter our friendship. Monday Night Football had boosted me to superstardom, and I think all it came to resent my celebrity. The bigger I got, the less control he had over me. I was always an independent person with a healthy ego, but I became even more fearless in disagreeing with him and telling him when I thought he was wrong. It rankled him. Nobody talked to him like I did and still do. And I know that Orlidge privately fumed when I wouldn't knuckle under. But Rune is a clever, calculating man, Machiavellian in nature, but gifted with uncommon intelligence. It's a combination of traits that he knows how to use with maximum effect. He understands that the flip side of my ego is the insecurity within me because of my background and my need for acceptance and financial security. He always did, and he tried to keep me in my place by making snide comments about me in the press. As the years went by, it was rare to get a compliment from Orlidge. He kept playing games with me, but I wouldn't crack and become his or anybody else's patsy. Of course, Orlidge and I continue to work with each other on various sports telecasts and at the 1976 Olympic Games in Montreal, but it wasn't like the old days. We slowly drifted apart. And once he took over ABC News, we saw even less of each other. He was struggling. I recall a night in Los Angeles when Herb Granath and I ran into Rune in the bar at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, and he stayed to have a drink with us. I told Orlidge, why don't you end your troubles? Make Jim McKay and me co-anchormen, and your ratings problems will be over. I was damn serious. I had always wanted to switch to hard news, but I stayed in sports because I had become famous, and I was very proud of my impact on the American public. Still, within me, there was the ever-present desire to cover national and world events, and Orlidge knew it. Don't think I haven't thought of that, Howard, Orlidge said. I'm not through with that idea yet. In subsequent conversations, whenever the topic of my switching to news came up, Orlidge would say, we're going to get to that, Howard. We'll show those bastards a thing or two about journalism. We never did. I'm sure that Orlidge was afraid of the beating he'd take in print if he used me on network news. It's too bad. I would have busted a gut for him, just as I had in sports, and I think we would have won. For several years, I resented Rune for not bringing me to news, and considering what had already happened between us on the variety show, I sometimes wondered aloud what the hell I ever saw in the man. I was wrong. 
just as he's been wrong for making statements to the press that denigrate me. Like, people don't like Howard, and Howard's insecurity makes it hard to deal with him. Remarks such as those hurt. I guess we're the kind of men who don't want to give an inch. Our egos get in the way. And I'm sure, for as long as we live, we'll probably continue to follow an adversarial cause. We've lost a lot of trust in each other, and maybe the wounds will never heal. I just don't know. David Halberstam won the Pulitzer Prize based on his reporting from Vietnam for the New York Times. Later, he achieved literary fame as the best-selling author of two books in particular, The Best and the Brightest and The Powers That Be. We first met in the early 1970s, but never really had much contact. Then one day, while talking business with Rue Knowledge, he said to me, by the way, what the hell does David Halberstam have against you? Beats me, I said. I hardly even know the man. Well, I met him at a party the other night, and he was all over me. He's got a real bug up his ass about you. I shrugged. What can I tell you, Rune? He's obviously got a problem. I know he has a childlike devotion to the Knicks. He's very immature about it. I've heard from Mike Burt, then the president of Madison Square Garden, that he bothers him with phone calls, telling him who should start, who should sit on the bench. The guy's a nut. A couple of years later, in December 1982, Halberstam authored a vicious attack on me in Playboy magazine. Apparently, he couldn't contain himself any longer. In the article, he called me, among other things, a bully and a monster, and went so far as to say I was merciless and violent. This from a man... I had only a passing acquaintance with. It was the worst kind of cheap shot I had ever read. He ended the article with a ludicrous attempt at psychoanalysis, trying to get inside my head and figure out my various neuroses. He never even bothered to call, to talk to me. So much for the fair and objective journalism he supposedly learned at the New York Times. Naturally, I had no idea that Halberstam was writing the article. I was made aware of it through a phone call from Gary Fencing, a football player who had taken a course I taught at Yale and went on to star at the defensive back position for the Chicago Bears. Do you know anything about an article that's coming out about you in Playboy? Fencing asked me. No. Why? It's just vicious, Howard. It's full of lies and distortions. It's terrible. And I can't believe who wrote it. David Halberstam. I always had such respect for the man. How could he write such garbage? Gary, I've been through this more times than I care to recall. There's nothing I can do about it. By the way, how did you find out about the article? My girlfriend is the centerfold for December, and she got an advanced copy of the magazine. I had to laugh. What a way to find out you've just been vilified in Playboy. I'm glad you can laugh, Howard Fensick said. I'd like to get the son of a bitch and strangle him. Despite Halberstam's attack on me, generally speaking, I've received even-handed and even praiseworthy treatment from the newspaper and magazine writers who don't cover sports. A recent example came on the night of January 16, 1985, when the Washington Journalism Review honored me as the best national television sports reporter. Other honorees included George Will, Ted Koppel, David Broda, Dan Rather, and Roger Mudd. We were all selected as the result of a Washington Journalism Review readers poll, and most of the respondents worked in print journalism. As for the sports writing fraternity, there's no question that I've been the victim of a long and abiding absence of responsibility. Some have even waged what can only be described as a literary pogrom against me. Now, let me make this clear. I don't mean to paint all sports writers and columnists with the same brush. Certainly, I've had my share of complimentary articles. If I may, I'd like to single out Sports Illustrated's Frank DeFord, a writer who has earned enormous respect within his profession. He was the author of a cover story about me 
and I shall always cherish the last paragraph in particular. First and foremost, he wrote, Howard Cosell is sports. There are all these people, these fans, who claim that when Cosell does a game on television, they turn off the sound on TV and listen to the radio broadcast. Oh, sure, you probably know critics in your neighborhood who vow the same thing. Well, too bad for them. Don't they understand? Cosell isn't television. He's not audio. Howard Cosell is sports in our time. Feel sorry for the people who turn off the sound. The poor bastards miss the game. The End. Copyright 1986. Dove Books on Tape.